Welcome to the Oracle Sports Podcast. Uh, we're back. Uh, we had a couple weeks hiatus, but we're back under new management, if you want to call it that. Um, I'm Oracle Sports Editor Nolan Brown. And I'm Hannah Halili, a new host. Hi. And so we're here today and we're back at it. I mean, we have our, our first uh, podcast with the two of us hosting. Um, you're probably wondering where Brian Hatab went. Um, well, he disappeared. And if you look at the last video that we had, uh, he kind of had his signing off. Um, he has since moved on. So I'm in charge now and, and we'll see where this goes. So um, Hannah, how are you? What's like, new? Um, I'm doing good. Um, I just painted my room just for the podcast. So my room used to be pink. Now it's white. So it won't be blinding or hurting anybody's eyes. So <laughs> did you just paint that? Yeah, I painted it two days ago. Really? Yes. Did you paint it just for this? Yeah, I did. <laughs> wow. That's, see, that's dedication. That's dedication to the Oracle Sports I was podcast. like, I can't be recording myself in a bright pink bedroom that I grew up in. And I've been wanting to paint it for a while. So I just, this was just like the final straw. So I just painted it. And I stayed up all night to do it. But it looks nice. You know, and it's worth it. It was. I, I feel, good. See, I feel like if you wanted to have a hot pink room behind you that's totally fine i mean <laughs> i didn't want people to know me as the girl with the hot pink bedroom but it's all good i'm just sitting here waiting for football season that's the only thing that i'm thinking about right now yeah me too i mean we we haven't gotten any sort of a word on whether it's going to happen whether it's not going to happen um it's kind of just all been up in the air right now and mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of factors that go into it um just with everything going on, especially state by state, um, if you look at certain laws and regulations with governors, I mean, some people want it, some people don't want it. Some people want pro sports, but not college sports. And it's kind of a whole mess right now. Everything's just up in the air, really. Yeah, and I feel like the biggest thing is that sports is kind of part of an American culture, and it's definitely a huge money maker for a lot of schools. So without it, I just wonder how the climate's going to change, and just like the overall effect, like how how is it going to be different? Because a lot of schools too, football season is the main event of that whole semester. So what are students going to do? You know, no tailgates, no football games. It's definitely going to change some things. Yeah, I know, and especially with, uh, I mean, we look out in California. Yeah, it's on the West Coast, but. Their governor basically said, you know, we're not sure if we if we want to have sports yet until there's a vaccine. Um, that's certainly something that's, you know, could be good for the health of, of the state as a whole. But I mean, looking at the other side, too, and you know, if you look at the Pac-12 conference, I mean, there are a lot of schools that are in California. And if they don't have a conference, I mean, you know, that, that that's one of the uh, power five conferences that is won't be playing um, to its full capacity. So it's interesting to see how many, how conferences across the board, I mean, they got member schools from different states and it's like, are you gonna play without this team? Are you gonna play with this team in some sort of fashion? Are you gonna have to, like, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. You could look at the soccer league in Europe that just got back. We could be seeing a huge stadium of just fans and masks. We could see, you know, every other seat to where we have to all stay six feet apart or maybe only like coaches are wearing masks and there's no audience at all. Like it's just going to change everything. Yeah, that's interesting, especially with the, the Bundesliga that just came back. Um, I was watching one of the games and I haven't really been too much into the Bundesliga. I've been trying to get into it. But I saw it was on, I was like, live sports, I'm going to watch it. And just the stadium, I mean, it, they were playing, I think, in Dortmund's Signal Iguna Park. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. But, I mean, they, it's a capacity of like 80,000 people. And it's just completely empty. And in a way, it's, it's, it's a little bit nice because you can kind of hear, like, the players. You can hear what they're saying. And it's kind of cool hearing that stuff. But it's also kind of eerie because it's like you don't hear – you know, the crowd and stuff like that. And, and uh, Borussia Dortmund, the team that was playing, they have this, this yellow wall. It's like what their fan section is called. And it's probably one of the loudest ones in Europe. And it wasn't there. And it's, it's a weird thing to, to not see it there. 
I feel like something that adds to the whole experience itself is just being surrounded by fans who are die hard loving that team that you're cheering on, just like the rush and you know, the loud noises and the stomping on the bleachers and stuff like that. And just to think about a season where that's not going to be there is kind of, yeah, like eerie, kind of scary in my opinion. Like imagine like watching a football game and like the camera is just not, there's just, you can't see the audience. Like it's just empty. And I feel like as Bulls, we know how big Raymond James is because we're lucky enough to play in that stadium. And that, like, in itself, it's already hard to fill up that stadium. I can't imagine just, like, it empty. That's so weird. Yeah, they have it completely empty. They're going to have to find a way to kind of, like, fill in some stuff. I mean, I know they – some people have speculated, oh, are you going to have mic'd up, you know, refs? Are you going to have mic'd up, uh, you know, players and stuff like that? Yeah, they already have stuff like that, but – are they going to do it more so? And are they going to have things to kind of keep people entertained and have commentary that's maybe a little bit more exciting at times? Because, I mean, you you want to rely to – I mean, you think about how much that that fan noise is there. I mean, it's kind of like a background thing, it seems like. But Mm -hmm. when you take it away, I mean, it definitely – it really affects the whole atmosphere of the whole stadium. Yeah, and I think I read something, and it was – it was a study and when someone screams very loud they let out like a lot of like spit particles so like just having an atmosphere like that it's hot you know everyone's yelling screaming you're super close together because that's just how it is and you know I guess technically from that term it's unsafe for this coronavirus and pandemic and I always loved sports because it was part of our culture and it was something I never thought would go away and just kind of seeing it evolve into something completely different for the time being, kind of scary. And, you know, with who we're about to talk to, I'm sure it was really difficult for him too, just getting recruited through a pandemic. Like he couldn't even tour, he could probably couldn't even tour schools. Yeah, we're talking about a recent grad transfer, Mitchell Brinkman. Uh, we'll be talking with him later on down the road but for now I kind of want to just jump back into uh, talking about you know no fans in a stadium or even if you look up at at what what we do I mean up in the press box and having you know is there going to be some sort of uh, sort of rule for journalists are they not going to be able to sit up in the press box are they not going to be able to sit next to each other and um, I know Hannah you have you been to Raymond James press box yet? No, I haven't. I'm looking forward to it. It's it's pretty big. It's it's really cool. I think it's I'm one so of excited. <laughs> like it, that's all I'm looking forward to. Like it, I think about fall, and that's what I'm mainly looking forward to is going for football season, sitting in that press box and watching the new team, the new coach, just the new transfers, and just you know the new game plan. Like what what's changed about our football team, and I guess now how we're treating it with the pandemic. Yeah, and from that point of view, I mean, it's it's so exciting to see, you know, there's so much that is building up with USF. It's like, you know, there's a lot that's that's new that's coming in, and everyone just wants to see it. And, you know, us as journalists, too, we, we want to see it as well. And, you know, will they let us in the press box? I mean, I'm sure they will at some point, but, I mean, it's a pretty big press box. It's it, it's sprawling in a way. I mean, with the, the, the media that covers USF football, I mean, occasionally you know I think last year when they played Cincinnati they had a lot of people I remember they had a guy from the athletic there so he was filling in for something but I mean it depends on the game how much how much journalism support you'll have Um, but it's really not that much I mean you could theoretically all sit in the press box but well, they have to have us wear masks up there. You know, what's going to be the the sort of uh, the go-to? We don't know is the thing. I mean, we could only just speculate, but at the end of the day, we don't know. Yeah, and, you know, there's still even the talk about public schools in general, just college. Are we even going to have fall classes, let alone fall sports? And just that whole question in the air is kind of scary. And, you know... It's a lot, and it's just trying to think about when I picture it, just sitting in the press box and trying to report with a mask on, or, you know, there's people, like, from Bulls Radio sitting there with their microphones, like, actively reporting. They're going to have their mask on. You know, people are already starting to make USF-themed masks and sell them on Facebook. So That's actually, that's pretty cool. I mean, like, I hope we 
don't get to a point where i mean i don't know i guess it'd be good to have everyone wear one you know to keep safe for everyone but i mean there's some people that are saying you know if you wear a mask and let's say you have it you're breathing that in all day i mean i'm not a scientist i'm not a doctor or anything but you know i don't know if that's confirmed or anything but like you know that really makes you think it's like yeah we're all told to wear masks and you know definitely social distance that's the thing but like you know if you're wearing that constantly or if you're wearing that um and for extended periods of time it's like is that even compromising yourself further i mean you don't really know that's so true and like i think about the, all the security that goes through just trying to enter raymond james just the metal detectors, the people scanning you, the clear bags. And now on top of that, there's probably going to be fever tests. Like if you have a fever, you can't enter. And, you know, that's going to be another thing, like with players or coaches, like what if they have a fever? Will they not like, like enter the stadium? Will they not be able to do that? Like, that's just so crazy. I feel like if you have like, you know, one player, one coach on the team who has it, I feel like that team just has to go and quarantine basically. and you know, even if that team doesn't have it. And I know we talked a little bit earlier about across states. I mean, USF's first opponent is Texas. And the Texas governor has said, yeah, we're not sure about sports coming back in the full capacity. So what are the measures going to be? And and let's say, you know, someone gets it in Texas and then that spreads to USF. And, and what's going to happen with that? So there's a lot of unknowns right now. And, and they're kind of just trying to push ahead with some sort of a way of, of keeping it, you know, in balance. I know Iowa State, they tried to kind of uh, get towards steps of bringing stuff back. Um, they made news recently because basically students who were going through physical rehab or anything like that, they still needed to go through it. And so the trainers needed to work on them. And so they had to fill out a very extensive survey, you know, asking if you had any of the symptoms, you know, you weren't supposed to come in and once you get there, you know, you get screened, you get tested and whatnot. There's a lot of steps before you get there. But as I was reading an article about it, I'm thinking, you know, this is a lot, but it's kind of necessary. And that could become the new norm, uh, not even just for rehab, just for bringing back sports in general. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to think that you wrote it in your article, 15 down to one of the number of athletes they saw in an hour. It's going to kind of slow down the progress if you think about it they're not going to be able to see as many athletes at one time the injured athletes aren't going to be able, I mean they could always do the recovery at home but it's there's something different about seeing a physical therapist or an athletic trainer in person so they can see how you're moving and working on it and just thinking that they won't be able to see them as often is that going to slow anything down or is that going to affect the whole program in general yeah, a lot of unknowns. Just the fitness too. I mean, when you think about it, the first step to coming back before you can get games is, is getting fit. I mean, weight um, room, gym. Yeah, I mean, we've we've talked to athletes who have you know said, oh yeah, I have a weight room in here, but you know, are you doing the the workout right? Are you you know your form correct? You don't right. You don't, you don't have a spotter if anything. Yeah, I mean, like even even if you do have a spotter, it's like you know, are they are they making sure that your posture is correct and things like that. And, you know, it's, it's as a professional or a college athlete or, you know, anywhere in between, it's important to have someone to, to train you basically and someone to have to, you know, watch over you essentially and make sure you're doing it right. Make sure you don't go out into a game and, you know, break a leg or something like that. That's probably the last thing you want to do. And I know where I am, gyms are just starting to open up. But like it's, you know, reduced capacity, you can't enter with a fever or anything. And I know in Tampa, they're like slowly starting to open up, but I don't know anything about the USF one. But, you know, everyone's kind of just, you know, not even athletes, everyone, like people who just want to work out in general, are all kind of like anxious about it. And just, you know, a lot of people put their health, you know, not as their main priority right now, because we're stuck inside. So, you know, I'm sure it's even harder for athletes, even like, picture that and have that as their priority because even you know coaches can't really make it mandatory for people to train right now yeah definitely and um well like we said earlier you know that's, that'll be a good segue into our conversation with uh tight end mitchell brinkman i mean he 
he's been working out a bit, but he hasn't had that sort of support from uh, from coaches or anything in terms of you know, being able to work out and whatnot. And so it's just a, a brief touch on, on what we talked about. And so um, I think it's a good time, and we'll we'll cut to that. Our guest this week is a uh, a new a new bull, um, a tight end grad transfer from NIU. Uh, we have Mitchell Brinkman here today. Mitchell, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Uh, where are you joining us from today? So I'm still in DeKalb, Illinois, uh, where NIU is located. Okay. Um, so I want to first start off by asking, uh, what is that process like of, of getting recruited for a new school, getting ready to transfer to a new school uh, in the middle of a pandemic? There's a lot going on. Yeah, so the whole process um, was not ideal and it was completely hectic. Um, you know, I, I went in the portal, I think on Monday at like 3.30, I got the email. And then I think by four o'clock, I had my first phone call. And then I don't think my phone like left my hand for the next like 24 hours. <laughs> it was just nonstop, um, you know, call after call from, you know, different schools and different coaches. And, uh, you know, it was different because all these coaches were telling me, like, oh, we'd love to have you on a visit, but obviously we can't. So if you want a virtual tour, tour like, that's what we're here for. And I was, um, you know, it was just something that well, I really wasn't, um, you know, interested in. I just wanted to get to know the coaching staff and find the best fit for me, um, you know, as an athlete and academically. So. Nice. Um, how did you catch the attention of USF? Well, um, Coach Scott actually um, messaged me on Twitter first, and then um, my old tight end coach at NIU, Coach Sorrentino, he coached with Coach Wise at Florida Atlantic uh, two years ago. So they had a connection, and uh, they kind of talked about me and stuff. And so that ended up working out uh, really well. That's pretty good. And so you're living – in Illinois right now, but you were originally born in Iowa, Council Bluffs, Iowa, just right outside of Omaha, Nebraska, for those people listening. Um, what's it like growing up in, in a city like Council Bluffs? I mean, you got Omaha right there. You know, there's, I'm sure there are things to do, but what was it like growing up there? Uh, I had a really good experience growing up. Um, you know, I went to the same school my entire life, so it was, it was nice playing with the, with the same group of kids. And, um, you know, that's kind of why uh, I ended up staying in Illinois is just because it felt kind of the same as Iowa, um, just that Midwestern feel. And, you know, definitely with the weather, I'm excited for the change. So. <laughs> yeah, probably no more shoveling snow or anything like oh, that. Oh, yeah, 100%. It's the worst. <laughs> yeah, we got – right now it's probably like, I don't know, 90 or 80-something out right now. But <laughs> once it gets in the summer, it gets a little scorching. But I don't know. We've had some nice couple days so far. Yeah, yesterday was in the 50s here, so. <laughs> See, I'm a little bit jealous of that, just a little bit. You can every day in Florida. <laughs> so, so back to uh, your, your growing up, um, what was there to do, and what was like your spot, basically, growing up as a kid? Um, yeah, so I have a, an older brother who's uh, two years older than me, and so pretty much our spot was – um, just right outside of the school, there's a field, and that's really where we would go um, if we weren't in our own backyard, you know, playing sports and doing stuff like that. But, um, you know, other than those things, we were, you know, just like any other kid playing video games, you know, doing stuff like that. So, Growing up, did you always want to be a college football player? Was this always what you wanted to do, or did you have anything else in mind? Yeah, so growing up, I've always wanted to, you know, be an NFL football player. So this is kind of the first step in doing that. Um, I've had the luxury of both my parents being college athletes. And then my dad played linebacker in Northern Iowa. So I grew up, you know, loving football, going to football games, traveling all over the country, um, you know, to watch different teams and stuff like that. So it's something that I've been very passionate about since a very young age. So what did both oh. – oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Hannah. With um, both of your parents as college athletes and you growing up kind of like in that environment, were the, was there any added pressure or any other lessons that you learned just, you know, being exposed to that at a, at a young age? Um, well, they both like assured me that they, they would pressure me as long as I'd want it. And, 
the second I said no, they would obviously let up. And I, I really never said no because I knew the goals I've set out to accomplish and stuff like that. And I knew, um, you know, especially my dad having played at the, you know, division one level that he knew what it took. And um, so, yeah, definitely. I didn't shy away from the, the added pressure from my parents for sure. So your dad played linebacker. Did he ever, you know, ask you, Hey, you know, you want to check out defense or you want to try out your line, uh, your line play? <laughs> yeah, I actually, uh, I played both ways in high school. So I played linebacker and then D end um, in high school, but I, there's nothing like scoring a touchdown. So I opted with going to the offense. So. <laughs> and so, and just a little bit in terms of your off field aspirations, uh, you're studying business administration. Um, you recently, you're, you're, I guess you're going towards your MBA. Um, and then you have your aspirations of becoming a, an athletic director in college. And, you know, at USF, we have a pretty great one. Have you had a chance to talk to Michael Kelly and, and kind of feel out the waters a little bit? Yeah, we actually, uh, we had a Zoom meeting, or I think with Microsoft Teams with Mr. Kelly, and then Coach Scott, Coach Wise, and, and Coach King. And, um, they kind of laid it all out for me about the different opportunities that Tampa offers and all the connections he has. And, you know, it was a pretty easy decision after talking to him for about an hour. <laughs> Tampa definitely has a lot of connections in that sense. I feel like everybody knows everybody, especially in the sports environment. Yeah, that's what it seemed like for sure. So I want to talk a little bit about a game a while back. I, it was the 2018 MAC championship game. Uh, 3029 NIU, you were the one that actually you set up the game winning touchdown. Um, that was that was probably one of your best games, at least on paper. I don't know if for you personally that ranks among the best, but it was your second start too. Do you remember that game and do you just remember what it was feeling like playing in that situation? Yeah, so that was the year um, I had opted to redshirt due to injury, so I only played four games. And uh, we knew the whole time that if we were making the back championship, I was playing in that game. Um, so it was, it was definitely a lot of fun, you know, playing in Ford Field. That would have been my second time playing, um, you know, up there. And it was a great experience. And, you know, coming, da- coming back from down 29 to 10, um, you know, there's, there's nothing really like it. So, yeah. With your injuries and everything, was it hard to just, like, the recovery process? Was that one of your biggest obstacles going through this journey? Yeah, it was, it was definitely tough. Um, I, I came back really fast and kind of re-aggravated the injury, um, which was difficult for me because the second I get cleared, I just want to, you know, keep moving and going, going, going. But <clears throat> um, I kind of pushed too hard and then had to sit out a couple more weeks, and then that's when we finally opted to uh, to redshirt. So it was definitely tough, but I kind of learned a different aspect of the game, um, watching my teammates, you know, out there playing and kind of accepting a different role on game day for some of the games. I want to look ahead a little bit to your 2019 season um, as a whole. That was probably one of your best ones. If you look at it on paper, it's kind of where you, uh, where you went off, basically, if you want to say. Um, what was the key to unlocking that season as, as your best football season? Yeah, so I definitely um, knew it was coming at some point. I thought it was going to be 2018, and then um, yeah, obviously I, I got injured, so I ended up being pushed back to 2019. But we had a, a new coaching staff come in, and, you know, I have a lot of respect, and I have great relationships with all those guys on that staff. And, you know, I feel like they did a great job of they, – they always talk about explo- exploiting your strengths. And so I feel like that's what, you know, they, they ultimately did this past season. Oh, Hannah, your mic's muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have like lawn work going on and my dog's been going crazy. So I don't want to like, have her bark in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> but um, comparison to Mitchell Wilcox, um, when did you first hear compare yourself to him or hear someone compare you to him? Yeah, so I, I knew about him. Um, you know, I just I try and keep up with all the tight ends around the country. But I did not even think like I didn't connect the dots that I mean, we had the same. I knew I knew we had the same name, but I didn't connect the dots that he he was eighty nine, and then it was probably I don't know thirty minutes after I committed, someone tweeted it, and I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't even <laughs> make that connection. So um, yeah, you know, it's definitely funny, and uh, all the tweets are pretty comical. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, you know, with your new journey here at USF, how do you want to set yourself apart from him and just, you know, make a name for yourself? Yeah. Um, obviously he had a great career and he actually messaged me and wished me the, you know, the best of luck, which I thought was pretty sweet. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to, you know, come in and, and play the same way I play. And, uh, you know, I'll obviously have a, have a different name on the back of my jersey that hopefully people can just <laughs> tell a difference by. So. Okay. Now the, the season is, hasn't been canceled yet, which is excellent. Um, it hasn't even been talked about putting on hold. And, you know, there's a lot of things that are up in the air right now. But if the season goes forward as planned and everything is, works out fine, uh, what are your aspirations for this season? I know USF is, you know, now we got Jeff Scott as a coach. We got an entire new coaching staff. There's a lot. It's kind of feels like it's, it's on the edge of something. Do you feel like there's a, a sort of, there's a chance that USF, this could be a turning point for them? Yeah, well, I definitely feel there's a lot of excitement, um, you know, in Tampa. Um, I'm only there virtually, so I, I can only say so much. But I just know that I'm excited to get down there and, you know, help out the program the best way I can, uh, whether that's, you know, on the field, leadership, in the locker room, off the field. Um, yeah, you know, whatever I can to, you know, help the team be successful. Now, I want to ask a little bit about uh, what you've been doing, basically, during this time. I think all of us have been stuck indoors. I know I'm going a little bit crazy. Sometimes I'll go out for a drive or whatnot, <laughs> but what have you been doing to kind of keep yourself sane and, and keep yourself grounded a bit yeah so my uh roommate and I actually put together a pretty intense weight room in our garage we live in a house here and uh you know we have two weightlifting platforms a rack 700 pounds of weight I think a vertimax row machine um so yeah we definitely have all we need as far as lifting goes so we've just been doing that and then um kind of doing some crazy stuff around the house uh we got on the roof a couple weeks ago and started hitting golf balls into a cup uh, <laughs> I missed it but we, we were up there for a good two hours so. <laughs> two hours wow yeah the hardest part with quarantine is just ha not having gyms I didn't realize how much it was going to affect me just not being able to go and work out <laughs> yeah definitely so it's it's been a blessing that uh, we were able to you know make this gym in a garage so <laughs> I have to ask, do you have footage of you guys hitting the golf balls on the roof? So I'd love to see that. Uh, yeah, I do have a, a little video of the – It honestly, the angle of the shot, it looks like it went in, so I'll send that one to you. So. Perfect. That works for me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You guys um, just outside of football, kind of like going back to, you know, you wanting to have a great career and just your whole journey in general, do you have any just kind of motivations outside of football or just who inspires you the most? Yeah, so a lot of my inspiration, it, uh, you know, comes internally, but there's definitely a lot of external factors. Um, you know, it's this past year, it was, it was, I was blessed to have, you know, 30 some catches and 400 some yards. So it, it always adds to the motivation of, um, you know, you know, wanting to build on that and, and build on your career for the, you know, the next level. So. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a great way to end it off kind of talking about your aspirations. Um, Mitchell, thank you so much for joining us. I know this is a, a weird time where we're all kind of you know, stuck indoors, but we're making the most of it. And thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you out in the field soon. Yeah, thank you guys. Hopefully I can get to Tampa soon. So <laughs> enjoy Definitely. the warm weather with you. <laughs> Thanks, Mitchell. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. That's our conversation with Mitchell Brinkman. Um, like we said, we're hoping to see him out in the field soon. We don't know when that'll be, but we're definitely hoping it's soon. Thank you for joining us. I've been Nolan Brown, and that's Hannah Halili. And we'll see you next time. To everyone listening, if you have any thoughts on what we said today about the coronavirus affecting college and pro sports, feel free to tweet us at USF Oracle Sports on Twitter. We want to hear your thoughts on what you think is coming up next in the sports world.